But without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you uh, Matthew Durfield. Uh, Matthew founded Durfield Construction in 1975 and moved his company to Whistler, in BC. Uh, discovering his Austrian roots, Matthew spent uh, time earning his career in Austria learning the time-tested practices of European log and timber firms. And uh, most recently, uh, he's very interested in what he's going to talk to you about today. So without further ado, here's Matthew. Thank you, Vanna. I'm most honored and humbled to be presenting to you today our experience in invo involvement with Passive House technology. Looking around the room, I recognize many professionals, including engineers and architects from whom we, as contractors, receive our information and direction. In the construction world, we're always working from your design pages. You're the people that push us out of our comfort zone to do the things that, from a practical perspective, often do not make sense. However, however, when the building is complete, we can stand back and be very pleased with what we as a team have created. On the screen, you will see some of the projects we have been involved with over the last 37 years. In order to begin this conversation with you, I think I have to tell you a bit of my story. This will help you to understand why I became convinced in 2008 that this is a better way to build and why our company has embraced this building philosophy. I think there are two types of people in the world. There are those that see an opportunity, investigate it, study it, and when they are convinced that it makes sense, they figure out how to implement it. Then there are those like myself, life simply happens to. And the only thing that they have to do is to react to poten potential opportunities. Over the years, it is somewhat how my career was shaped. Growing up in the small interior town of Williams Lake, I knew two things when I graduated from high school. I wanted to explore the world by going to university, and second, I needed a way to finance this dream. Working construction became the means. But I'm not entirely convinced that my choice of studies, philosophy, and psychology were the greatest choice for a future contractor. I soon realized that I loved working with wood, and with the revival of the log building craft in the early 70s, I found myself starting my career with a chainsaw and a pickup truck. In 1978, I was awarded my first job in building a log cabin in Whistler. At that time, the architecture focused on the A-frame or the Swiss chalet for a bit more money. People started becoming intrigued by the log house, so for the next 10 years, my brother and I built as many log cabins, both locally and internationally, as our little crew could produce. The mystique of the log cabin attracted some of our neighbors across the Atlantic, and soon we were joined by young Swiss or German carpenters on their apprenticeship journey. What, tran what transpired out of those relationships is that they influenced the local craft, and soon we were integrating European timber joinery techniques into our log buildings. Architects and de designers realized they could be much more creative with the medium of logs and began to build large post and beam structures that would allow them to be far more generous with light and glazing. Building in Whistler for the past 30-something years, I noticed a design shift from the full-on log house and post and beam structure to timber frame and craftsman style buildings, and finally, what we build today, the influence of the modern. For a small company like ourselves, where a three-man crew could build a log cabin complete in six months, we're now a team of over 40, and some of our projects can take two or more years to complete. As a result of the leaky condo fiasco in Vancouver, the construction industry became more organized through organizations like the CHBA, a local chapter was formed in the Sea to Sky area, and many of us enrolled in construction courses through Built Green and R2000 programs. We became more acutely aware of the importance of respecting building science, and things like air, tight, air tightness do make a difference. I have yet to do a blower door test on one of our older log cabins. With the news of the Olympics coming to Vancouver and Whistler, we, the construction industry, were preparing for the world. It was a massive construction project. As a side note, a number of years ago, I was visiting family in Austria, and they were convinced that they would be hosting the world in Salzburg and Kitzbühel in 2010. I remember thinking then, wouldn't it be great to do a project to showcase to Austria and the world 
what we Canadian log and timber smiths are capable of. So it's somewhat ironic that in 2008, the Chamber of Commerce asked if I would be interested to meet a group of Austrians, the APG, the Austrian Passive Group, who were looking for a contractor for the Austrian National House. I thought, great, an Olympic project? project? We might even make money during these games. This group of Austrian businessmen told me that they went to hear Colin Hansen, Minister of Economic Development in the Olympics, give a talk in Vienna about the Winter Games that were going to take place in Vancouver 2010. They were the best games, they were to be the best games ever done on time and on budget. They were also to be the first Green Olympics. These gentlemen, including an architect, an engineer, a window manufacturer, a prefab construction company, a ventilation company, a building, and a building science expert met after the talk. They took Mr. Hansen's announcement as a challenge. They would show the world what green really meant. The APG, the Austrian Passive House Group, was formed. The purpose of the APG was to demonstrate passive house construction to the world. Although this standard gained popularity and acceptance as the next generation of energy efficient construction in Europe, it had yet to successfully break into North America. The APG planned to use the Austria House to showcase their building products, the passive house technology, and prove that these buildings could be effective in Canadian climates and other parts of the world. The Austria House was the first registered passive house to be built in North America. They left an Olympic legacy that would contribute to the rise of sustainable housing in North America, implement the idea of passive house in Canada, and lead to partnerships with Canadian companies. If you haven't been through the building, you still can, as it is now a public building, and part of its purpose is to prom promote passive house construction. Apart from providing us with some income and the best schnitzel during the games, our work with the APG left us with some valuable lessons in building technology. What we, dis we discovered that what we learned in our Built Green and R2000 courses hold true for passive energy efficient houses. They all must be airtight, super insulated, respect thermal bridging, and be fitted with triple glazed high efficiency windows and have an have a high efficiency heat recovery ventilation unit. Passive House just takes these components to a whole new level. The Passive House roots are actually in Canada, and you know what they say. All good ideas are not invented, they are borrowed and improved upon. Many of you will recognize this house, the Saskatchewan Conservation Project built in 1971. This project was a Canadian response to the 1970s oil crisis, built in one of the coldest climates of the world. Its hallmarks were efficient design, air tightness, super insulation, triple glazed windows, and the first time an HRV and a blower door test were employed in a home. This project was the inspiration in North America for R2000 buildings and later for the energy influences in built green. The Europeans experienced the same oil crisis, but more importantly, their access to new oil re resources were totally dependent on outside sources and the related politics in bringing gas from Russia. Their collective response to this problem was to simply use less. Since housing consumes about half the energy we use, it made sense to build more efficient buildings. Two European physicists, Professor Bo Adamson in Sweden and Dr. Wolfgang Feist in Germany, were convinced that they could, through careful modeling, build a better house. Building on, these, on the ideas used in the Saskatchewan project, they developed the passive house concepts and standard. In 1991, the first passive house was constructed in Darmstadt, Germany. The passive house standard is a building that has a very small energy demand and also requires little to no active heating. As a builder, architect, engineer, consumer, we are faced with numerous green building standards on the market today. Each one offers different claims, qualifying for different incentives, and each requires a different application and approving body. The Passive House standard is really no different. What set it apart for us was that the approach made sense 
and the results were undeniable. This chart shows a quick comparison between a couple of the main building standards on the market today. What is important to note is the Passive House standard is the most stringent performance-based energy standard in the world. Passive House focuses on energy use and can be incorporated into a number of other building standards. In fact, LEED is in the process of integrating Passive House into their standard for the energy efficient component. Ultimately, the goal is to build more efficient, healthier, sustainable homes. So what is the Passive House standard? Passive House is not a prescriptive system. It doesn't tell you how to get there, but instead it is very specific on what you have to do to achieve that. The energy requirements for the house are limited to heating and cooling cannot exceed 15 kilowatt hours per square meter per year, and your total energy requirement cannot exceed 120 kilowatt hours per square meter annually. The formula further specifies requirements and thresholds for design, air tightness, insulation and thermal bridging, windows, and your HRV unit. The Passive House formula works to create an optimized design and building envelope that produces a building that requires 80 to 90 percent less energy needed to heat and cool the standard Canadian home. The small amount of energy required for heating and cooling is generated through passive solar gain, shading, appliances, body heat, and some additional active heating and cooling sources. Passive house is not a net zero house, but if one wanted to build a net zero house, following the passive house formula would be the quickest, most efficient way to achieve the goal. What is key to the passive house formula is that even with minimal heating inputs, the house remains comfortable. When the Austria house was under construction, many people were invited to tour through. I still remember one winter day when Shell Buzzy came for his visit. He brought his crew and a thermal camera. What impressed him the most was that all the surfaces, the floor, windows, concrete walls, and ceiling were within a couple of degrees of each other. Passive house design must be compact and efficient. This slide looks at the impact building design has on a building's heat loss. The most efficient shape is a box. More heat is lost as you increase the exterior wall surface area, forcing you to increase the thickness of your insulation to achieve the desired efficiency. The middle slide has an increased wall area of 10% requiring an overall increase of insulation thickness by 20 millimeters. The slide on the right has an increased wall area of 20%, and now we have to add an extra 40 millimeters of insulation. The key component when designing to the Passive House standard is the Passive House planning package, a bit of a mouthful, it, which is a design software commonly referred to as the PHPP. It has similarities to the HOT 2000 software when building an R2000 home. The PHPP is a comprehensive calculation tool that allows designers to accurately map and describe the thermal characteristics of their building. The Canadian Passive House Institute offers courses across Canada on the PHPP software. I have sent a number of our employees to these countries and would recommend them to anyone interested in pursuing Passive House design or construction. This picture depicts the importance of orientation and window placement in taking advantage of passive heating and cooling sources. A passive house wants to maximize the passive solar gains during the winter months while minimizing solar gain and the risk for overheating during the summer months. This is done by utilizing increased south-facing glazing, minimizing glazing on and minimizing glazing on the northern facades. Obstacles such as neighboring buildings and trees need to be considered for their shading input. Winter and summer passive solar gains are determined in detail using the PHPP, highlighting areas requiring more or less glazing or increased shading. Ideally, passive house planning should take place at this stage of, of the design. Whole subdivisions and developments can be planned so that each lot properly maximizes the passive house potential. 
I can see that developers could use this as a tool to show a very holistic approach when lobbying the public and the regulatory bodies during the development process. <coughs> crucial to an, ef to an efficient house is air tightness. And crucial to air tightness is getting the building science right for your structure. Leaky homes are hard to heat and cool. The only way to determine whether you have a leaky home is to measure the air leakage with a blower door test. The blower door test depressurizes a house, exaggerating the home's air leaks, making them easier to measure and locate. The blower door test is critical to determine and document whether a certain air tightness target has been met. A third party blower door test upon completion of the home is required to qualify for the passive house standard. A blower door test at mid construction is strongly recommend, recommended to locate and fix any leaks during the construction phase as opposed to waiting until the house has been completed. A good, go a good blower door test also gives you bragging rights to your competition, prospective home buyers, or your drinking buddies. Very well insulated homes can be completely compromised by a faulty vape air barrier. Any advice that I received from experts in the industry was your building can never be too tight and that your airtight layer has to be on the inside whereas your wind tight layer is on the outside. To achieve the passive house standard, you need to achieve an air tightness of less than 0.6 air changes per hour. This chart shows how the passive house air tightness requirement stacks up against the other comparables. The average Canadian home scores about five to seven air changes per hour, while Canada's most stringent energy standard, the R2000, requires, of an, requires an air tightness of 1.5 air changes per hour or less. Required insulation levels for individual buildings to achieve passive house standard is determined by using the PHPP software and the relevant climate data. Depending on the location within Canada, a house being built to the passive house standard will likely require two to three times better insulation than the requirement by the national and provincial building codes. To help illustrate what they mean by super insulation, here's a picture of the Austria House Foundation preparation. The house was designed as a slab on grade, so the challenge was not only to insulate but also to eliminate the big enemy, thermal bridging. This was achieved by placing the structural slab on a 10 inch double layer of EPS. This super insulation concept con continues through to the roof. This is a slide I took from Guido Vimmers, one of the heads of the Canadian Passive House Institute. These shots are excellent examples of thermal bridging. The slide on the left is doing exactly what we want it to do dissipating the heat from the air-cooled engine of the motorcycle, whereas the photo on the right demonstrates the challenges that we face in many of our existing building methods. We essentially have to rethink every penetration through the envelope. The placement of simple elements like beams, rafters, steel and concrete now have to be considered if they are acting as thermal bridges. We should start to look at the building as having an inside structure separate from the exterior structural elements. Windows are thermally the weakest point of the building envelope and can be the cause of up to 50% of the building's heat loss. It is therefore essential that the building use triple pane windows with low E coatings, insulated spacers and interpane voids, thermally broken frames and insulated installation. To meet the passive house standard you have to have a window that achieves a U-value of less than 0 0.8. The equivalent imperial measurement is, R, is about an R7 to an R8. The overall thermal performance of a window is given by three factors, the glass, the frame, and the PSI value for the spacer. To establish the actual performance of the window, a fourth factor has to be considered, the value for the installation. The window frame is the weakest point of the window and 
installations should be airtight and include insulation around the frame. You can spend a lot of money on really good windows, but if you don't install them correctly, your energy savings will be lost. Passive house windows are so efficient, they essentially become the heaters for your home. It is therefore critical to address the potential for overheating during the summer months when we're not looking for solar gains. This is done through overhangs, exterior blinds, and exterior shading. This is a picture of the exterior blinds from the Rainbow Passive House. The, bl the blinds were not installed until the middle of July, and once installed, the occupants noticed a huge difference in the interior temperatures and comfort of the house. And anytime you have an airtight house, you must have an HRV to introduce and circulate fresh air into the house. The incoming air is passively preheated or cooled using the outgoing stale air from the house. It is common for HRV units in passive houses, especially in our colder climates, to be combined with geothermal heat exchangers to temper the fresh air, the fresh incoming air before it enters the HRV unit. HRV units for passive homes must have a minimum heat recovery rate of 80%. This photo shows the mechanical system in the Austria house by Drexel and Weiss. Homes without a ventilation system are homes of the past. As Martin Halliday, a green building consultant, puts it, build tight and ventilate right. Three years ago in early November, I remember a particular day when we were busy setting up construction heaters on all of our job sites. I came to the Austria house, it was minus 10 outside, and the house was comfortable and warm inside. The Austria house, a 2,700 square foot building, was being heated with a 1,500 watt space heater. A 1,500 watt heater is essentially one of these. Proving the populist saying the passive house can be heated with a hairdryer. This was the moment that hit home for me. It not only made sense, but it worked too. As I mentioned before, the passive house standard is not prescriptive. There are many different ways to meet this standard. Working with Som Holzbau te Technik, the contractor for the Austria House, revealed to me that one can build an airtight building almost entirely out of wood. One can even build an eight-story building built to the passive house standard. Prefabrication, however, is the key. And this fits well with our building philosophy, as we are a wood-based company. Once the Olympics were over, the keys tapped dry and life returned to normal. We were left with an Olympic leg legacy and corporate responsibility to think, to rethink our building practices. After much back and forth, we decided as a company that we could and should be doing this in Canada. We set out working with different experts in Europe and Canada to develop a prefabricated panelized system that would meet the Passive House standard and fit with our building philosophy. We formed a new company, BC Passive House, to manufacture this system and created a pilot project, the Rainbow Passive House, to showcase the panelized system and to demonstrate to ourselves and to the building community that we could meet the standard. However, we were not going to be left to start this venture on our own. <coughs> Equilibrium Engineering, the engineer of record for both the Austria House and the Rainbow Passive House, were so committed to the Passive House concept that they bought into the company. When we were designing our prefabricated system, we had a number of goals we wanted to achieve with the design. Most importantly, we wanted to achieve the Passive House standard. We also wanted to demonstrate that the standard could be met for affordable construction costs. There are obviously additional and higher quality material requirements that lead to increases in costs over traditional 2x6 framing. The materials and panel design were chosen to maximize cost efficiencies. We also wanted to use sustainable building products with low embodied energy within our system. I remember reading a magazine article on a builder in Ontario who built a home to the Passive House standard. This builder stated that the Passive House standard can only be achieved using spray foam. Although there are many benefits to using spray foam, the disadvantages include that it is a petrochemically based product, it is diff difficult to dispose of in demolition, 
and it is toxic when flammable. Other possibilities that we would consider for our system are our wood fiber insulation, rock wool, hemp, or sheep wool. Our main insulation that we use is cellulose fiber. Essentially what we're looking for are our natural products. Additionally, we wanted to use locally available materials wherever possible. Standard framing lumber, engineered wood, and OSB and plywood were our main choice for materials. Unfortunately, to meet the strict passive house standard requirements, we were forced to import some of the building product from Europe. We are currently working with different research centers to source local alternatives. In addition to being sustainable, we wanted to create a healthy system that produced a healthy living environment and that was constructed from natural, non-toxic materials, creating a system that was airtight yet allowing vapor to diffuse to the exterior, eliminated the potential for mold within the structural wall. The system also works in combination with the HRV to mitigate interior humidity and improve air quality. There are always limitations when transporting goods and materials. The length of trailers, the height of bridges, and underpasses can restrict the panel size. The panelized system was designed to meet these restrictions. It is critical that the shop drawings take into account these limitations. This is the diagram of the end result, detailing the prefab wall system created for the Rainbow Passive House. The main wall is, the main wall is standard framing. In Whistler, we used 2x10 framing, and in Surrey, a 2 by 8 wall was adequate, and in Fort St. John, we needed to bump it to a 12-inch wall. The roof and floors are typically built with TGIs to allow for longer spans and more insulation. This is the structural wall, though I sometimes refer to it as the insulation wall. It also provides the bulk of the required insulation. It is the component that we prefabricate. Air and the air and vapor barrier, the, which we call the Holy Grail, is located on the inside of the walls and the floor and the roof. Again, the air and vapor barrier is brought to the inside of the wall where it is close to the warm, moist, moist air and less susceptible to con condensation. To create this barrier, we are using OSB taped and sealed with high performance tapes. The exterior sheathing is a wood fiber moisture resistant diffusion board that is 25 times more open to diffusion than the interior OSB. This creates an airtight yet vapor diffusion open system. To meet code in certain places, an additional bonded Gore-Tex layer with similar diffusion rates like Tyvek must be added to the exterior sheathing board to block moisture and wind egress while still allowing the diffusion of vapor from the interior. With the diffusion open system, it is key that the exterior is vented. Rain screens for the walls are sufficient. We typically build a cold roof to support finished roof overhangs that are sufficient to ventilate the roof. Once the prefab elements are in place and all the seams are taped, we install what we call the service wall. This is another non-structural wall framed inboard of the exterior wall, floor, or roof. The main purpose of the service wall is to provide a place to run all the plumbing, wiring, venting, and any other mechanical systems that the house requires, eliminating unwanted penetrations to our holy grail, the vapor, the air barrier. Once the services are installed, we also insulate the service wall cavities. The framing of this wall should be offset with the framing of the structural wall to reduce thermal bridging. We typically insulate with blown cellulose in the insulation wall and rock sol bath insulation in the service wall. Our insulation of choice would be wood fiber insulation, but that is not yet available from a North American producer. Development of this system did not come without its challenges, learning curves, victories, and lessons. These challenges, victories, and lessons continue with each project. 
Here are a few of those lessons from our experience to date. The design and execution needs to be a collaboration from the beginning. The engineer, the architect, and the contractor, building officials, and the prefab provider need to have a clear understanding of the project's goals and how to go about meeting those goals in a cost-effective manner. Each party also needs to understand that everyone's actions impact the project. The airtightness plan needs to be determined prior to construction. I know I mentioned this before, but it's worth mentioning again. This cannot be an afterthought. Before the first hammer was swung, there was a service plan for the Rainbow Passive House and panel design and connections were detailed to maximize air tightness. Penetrations to the air barrier are determined prior to manufacturing and are framed into the panel and then insulated and sealed once the services have been installed. Subtrades were instructed and monitored throughout the construction process. Here you can see the creation of the continuous air barrier without penetrations. This picture shows the constructed service wall with the services. Note the air barrier has not been penetrated to run these services. Compared to the 6 mil poly air and vapor barrier system shown here, it is very difficult to create an airtight seal with the hundreds of penetrations that occur throughout the poly layer when the services are installed. Poly is also easily torn or damaged making creating a continuous airtight barrier even more difficult. We built this particular house at the same time as we were constructing our rainbow project, and the best we could do on our blower door test was 3.8 air changes per hour, significantly more than the 0.25 and the 0.3 that we were able to achieve on our rainbow project. It was only with Pre-planning, choosing a durable air barrier, and using a double wall system that we were able to achieve the lower door test scores of 0.25 and 0.3 for the Rainbow Passive House. The newest edition of BCBC will require all new homes to undergo a lower door test and to achieve 3.5 air changes per hour, a long ways off from the Passive House requirement. There are many different products that qualify as air and vapor barriers available that can be used in wall, roof, floor, and floor assemblies in countless different ways to achieve an acceptable wall system. What is important and cannot be stressed enough is that the building science needs to be right. In creating a vapor diffusion gradient, a rule, a good rule of thumb that your, is that your exterior should be at least 10 times more vapor diffusion open than our vapor barrier. Passive house systems like ours typically use an open vapor diffusion system while still observing the 10 to 1 rule of thumb. Another important lesson, reduce your thermal bridging in your envelope. And eliminate supporting beams that, crossed, that previously crossed from interior to exterior. Note the build-up no build and members and cripples need not to be as deep as the wall cavity, giving the ability to insulate behind these extra framing members. As I mentioned previously, our work with the Austria House Group and subsequent learning trips to Europe has convinced us that it makes sense to prefabricate when constructing to these standards. Prefabrication allows you to control the building environment construct on a horizontal surface and reduce both in-plant and on-site waste. It also increases efficiency and quality control while reducing construction costs. Prefabrication also leads to increased efficiency in the building envelope by making it easier to achieve precise, tightly joined components that through, then through on-site construction. The panels arrive on site pre-insulated with the option to have the windows, doors, and the siding already installed. Once on site, the construction window is dramatically reduced, averaging three to seven days to get out of the weather. Prefabrication becomes an attractive construction method for high efficient buildings, as well as challenging work sites and unfavorable weather conditions. Prefabrication adds value, 
efficiency, quality, and precision, which when building an airtight, efficient structure makes a difference. The biggest benefit of prefabrication would have to be the ability to control your building environment. This picture was taken at our Williams Lake plant, depicting the typical weather throughout the manufacturing process of the Rainbow Passive House. The panels were never expo exposed to the rain throughout the entire period, preventing any potential warping or swelling of materials and growth of mold. I don't think that the carpenters minded being protected from the weather either. One of the more important lessons and one that should never be un underestimated is the journey that can leave you all tied up in red tape. The Austria Passive Group taught us that when introducing a new concept, make sure that you sell before you build. When working in new municipalities and jurisdictions, it is essential to go in and work with the municipality right from the beginning to address any concerns or questions that they may have regarding their approval process or your new product. This may not be the most sophisticated assembly line, but in many ways, building site-built houses is comparable to how cars were built before Henry Ford's revolution. It does, it simply makes sense to build our homes in a controlled environment where accuracy and efficiency are greatly improved. I remember touring a group of architects and builders from France through the Austria house and asked them their opinion of prefabrication. Their response was, is there any other way? This slide shows the installation um, which is done in the plant. And every once in a while we would inspect just to make sure that it actually did fill up everywhere. It is critical that everyone works to the same shop drawings. We want it to fit. Gasketing and joint sealing are critical throughout the entire build. So far, so good. The Rainbow Project, a 3,000 square foot duplex, required four trucks. What this fellow standing on is, is the one side we did with cross laminated timbers as, as the intermediate floor. And you definitely need a crane on site. And if everything's done right, it will fit. With the installation of the roof panels, we're getting close. And ideally, we set up in good weather. The Gore-Tex type membrane being installed on the roof is shown here. To get the Rainbow Passive House out of the weather, four and a half days. Note that the door frame in this slide has been connected to the air and vapor barrier with these high performance tapes. HRV piping is brought through the predetermined location. The other, the other little pocket is for, is for plumbing. This picture of the HRV intake in the bedroom. Note that the service wall is insulated after the services are installed. This is a shot of the mechanical room in our rainbow project, showing what I call the heart and lungs of the building, the HRV. These vacuum solar tubes fuel the domestic hot water for the house. There's a little geo loop in the backfill which feeds, feeds into the HRV. This is a shot of the little project that we did in Surrey just after setup. Here's a quick time lapse of the assembly of the Rainbow Passive House.
passive house is not just for houses. Here are some examples of ski lodges, multiplexes, skyscrapers, manufacturing plants, grocery stores, schools, high rises, and so on. We can build greener, healthier, and more comfortable and create a new way of living. This is a picture of the plant, the, the people that did the HRV for the Austria house, that's their plant. Apartment blocks. Grocery stores. This is kind of a fun project. Um, this was a demonstration project done on Weissensee. The house actually rotates to follow the sun. It can rotate 360 degrees. This is kind of my favorite project. This would be at the, the same elevation as the top of Whistler. It's in the Vienna watershed. It's completely off-grid, and it's fully passive house. No access by, by road. Everything was flown in by helicopter. Passive house, a greener way of living. According to the Canadian Green, Green Building Council, lighting, heating, and cooling of buildings in Canada account for 50 to 60 percent of our annual greenhouse gas emissions, a building standard that reduces the average Canadian home's energy consumption for heating and cooling by 70 to 90 percent will have a dramatic impact on Canada's energy use and CO2 emissions. a more practical, economical way of living. Passive house construction comes at a small premium, but the payoffs are huge. According to the Canadian Passive House Institute in Europe, you are currently looking at an incremental cost of 3 to 9 percent to build passive houses. In Canada, passive house is new on our market, and the incremental cost will be higher, averaging 10 percent, 10 percent maybe as high as 15 percent. However, the dramatically reduced operating costs help offset the incremental costs for increased insulation, better quality windows, and ventilation systems. For example, the annual bill for heating and cooling of the Austria House, a 2,700 square foot public use building, $233.75 for the year. These reduced operating costs are also also offer security from future energy cost increases. It's a healthy way of living. The constant flow of fresh air, fresh filtered air reduces symptoms for those with allergies or asthma. Fresh filtered air also decreases the occurrence of sickness. There's a complete exchange of air six times a day. And increases concentration levels, good for schools, offices, and Vegas. Passive house provides a quieter way of living. You live beside a freeway, you have a son who has a, who has a garage band, you're in a unit in a multiplex, there's a house being constructed next door, no problem. Passive house boasts superior noise control. Gone are the days when you shy away from your picture windows in the winter or experience cold drafts or cold surfaces. You no longer experience the reverse radiation you feel when you're near picture windows. Reverse radiation is when your body heat is drawn to the cold surface of the window and consequently you feel cold. There are many reasons to build to the passive house standard, but I think that the main reason has to be for the people that live in these buildings. It's a picture of Dawn who bought one of our units at, at, in the Rainbow House. And this is what she told me to tell you. When I used to come home, I would take off my boots, my toque, and my mittens. Now I'm so comfortable, I just want to take it all off. <laughs> As we come to a close, I'm going to leave you with a couple of ideas from our mentors in the Austrian Passive Group. Reinhard Weiss from Drexel and Weiss has this saying, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. That means all of us, the builders, the architects, the engineers, the trades, the consumer, the municipalities, governments and material providers, and so on. Paulus Freisinger, the owner of OptiWin and one of the most enthusiastic proponents of the passive house co concept, 
once told me that if I ever buy into the concept, the most important task is to spread the word. This is not information that you can keep to yourself so that you have an advantage over your competition. He was convinced that every building should be done to this standard and that the only way to stay ahead of your competition was to simply be better. In closing, I want to invite all of you to be, to be my competition and to build better houses. Let's continue to push the envelope and put Canada back in the forefront of green construction. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you. I really enjoyed that. Um, a question for you about the um, the, in the 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 air and vapor barrier, the rigid board uh, system you're using. I've got two questions. Number one, how do how do you deal with that at floor penetrations? You know, where the framing penetrates it, and you have to seal it. And number two, um, you're also you ha you built a service wall inside that for your plumbing, etc., and you insulated that. Is is that insulation sort of a bonus, or is that a, is that an essential part of the passive design? Because so if so, does does the service wall carry right through the structure? Yeah. The answer to number two is that this this the insulation in the service wall is actually calculated into the PHPP, so it is part of that requirement. Um, what's important to know is because it's essentially a mass wall system. It's a, big, it's a big thick wall. And your air barrier, vapor barrier, or your vapor barrier has, cannot be further in than one third. So there's kind of that magic formula. So that, I think, does that answer that question? And the other question, I think, was the, how do you connect the floor and the... How do you maintain the continuity? And that's, and that's, that's always a key, and that's kind of goes to, you gotta figure this out before you even design the thing. Um, so what we, and, and there's, l there's several ways around this, what we came up with is you actually let the floor, the wall run through about a foot, and you connect the floor to the wall. So instead of, si instead of like platform flaming, framing, where you would land the floor on top of the wall, you'll run the wall past it, and so your, your vapor barrier at that point is continuous, and we'll pre-tape any joints that we have at that point, right? And so then you will, after the fact, or during the build, connect your floor, but then you, when you connect your wall to wall, that's a really simple connection, because you can access it from inside and outside. Um, the blown-in insulation that you, in the walls, is there like a, an adhesive there, or does it, is there that chance that it'll sort of compact over time, like you saw in the, the old days with the blown yeah, insulation? Yeah, and, and that's kind of why we would start cutting these holes in there. And I was, I remember, because we brought this Austrian fellow over to, to help us with this and to run our plant. <coughs> and he was convinced you've got to use blown in the blown cellulose, et cetera, and kind of liked the idea. But that was, you know, you're slamming doors for the next 50 years. Eventually, you're going to shake that stuff down. Um, bit like the zonal light in old brick buildings, right? You know, after a while, it's four inches shorter. Um, and I talked to the manufacturer, they, I think they produce this stuff in Edmonton. You know, are there any fears of that? Um, there's two types of blown insulation. There's the stuff you blow into the ceilings, and that does have a propensity to settle a little bit because it's fairly, it's fairly lightweight. Um, we're actually using what they call their wall bar insulation, so that's blown into a wall cavity, so it's much denser. And the way he, they explained it to me, it's got a bit of a, it's got a bit of uh, starch in it. And so with the ambient humidity in the air, that actually kind of sets it. And so it's, it's essential. And we would, you know, we did it some test panels and we tried to shake them up and down and try to, try to move it. And it just doesn't, does not seem to move. Okay, well, thank you again, Matteo. Excellent presentation. One last...